I'm Dr. Timothy Johnston. We're here talking today about team training for dental offices and what makes a great office versus an average office, or more importantly, how you can take an average office and really promote it up to the amazing dental office level. This whole team training seminar started off as just instructions for my own team, my own staff, when I found that I wasn't able to give my clear instructions on how we operated to each and every new employee as we hired them. As I grew bigger and we acquired more offices, it really became difficult to know that everybody was getting the same educational experience in terms of our customer service versus the, the other people. Uh, some of my longer term staff who had been with me for 20 or 25 years, of course, knew everything that we were doing and the newer people were having a tougher time catching on. So we decided to hold a seminar, which we did, and then decided to go ahead and tape this so I could share it with the rest of the dental practices in the world. This is not about clinical teaching. I'm not here to tell you how to do a better crown or cut a better margin. This is about customer service, which is really my area of expertise. And the first module is where I'm gonna show you sort of my background and help you to understand why I might be qualified as an expert in customer service in the dental office so that you'll take what I have at my word. All right, in the beginning, Let's back up, because this is where I started. In the beginning, I started Norge Dental Center. It was just my name at the time, because that was the law. You could only name a practice after your own name back in the late 80s. So in my early days, here I am in a small, uh, it's not a strip center, it's just a little office park. I had 1,200 square feet. I had one dental chair and one employee. I'm proud to say that I had both of those for a long time. I still have employees numbers three and four working for me today, almost 30 years later. Um, Things grew over time. Uh, that's my dad and I on the front porch trying to, uh, he was there helping me set up my very first computer. Uh, that was late 80s. We had to buy the parts for a computer off the internet and put it together ourselves. And that was just so that we could type papers and things. Uh, but anyway, first office, it was relatively open. We ended up putting in one chair and uh, we had room for four. We plumbed for all four. That lasted me for six months and then we grew a little bit. That's my lovely wife, Kelly. She's there helping me unpack some of the original boxes. This is late 1989. Had an open house, had to fill the space, so we put a bunch of hanging plants and boxes over the plumbing and all that, just so that it didn't look like we were just totally, you know, nothing going on there, totally void and empty. So put some balloons up, bought an extra chair. That little chair right there is a Georgetown special. When Georgetown Dental School closed in uh, 1990, uh, they sold off a lot of stuff. That was a $25 chair, little steel wool to the bottom, it looked good as new just using it for things like suture removals and exams, but it was the first stage of real growth. When I went from one chair to sort of one and a half, I felt like I was on my way six months in. Today, this is Norge Dental Center. This is my practice now. Uh, we moved in there in 2003. Um, we now have a total of five dentists, myself plus four others, a staff of 34 and 16 treatment rooms. We just have applied to the county for a building expansion, and we're gonna add eight more operatories over the next year. So to say that we've done something successful, I think is an understatement, and it's all been because of our customer service. I think my crowns are as good as anybody else's, but patients don't know that. They don't know the quality of your dental work unless it either hurts or falls apart. What they're judging us on, the reason they send their friends to see us, the reason we've had such explosive growth over the years and consistent growth is simply customer service. So we'll get to all that. The second set of practices started just about five years ago for me when I decided it would be fun to open some or buy some struggling dental practices and build them back up and then sell them. So fun might be an exaggeration of the word, let's say a lot of hard work. Uh, but it did teach me that our customer service techniques are working. I could see a very clear definition of a practice that was growing based on the people in there operating under our customer service guidelines versus a practice that was declining because the people that we hired, inappropriate hires perhaps, just weren't following up on how we said to do things. So over time, I could predictably see if a practice was going to grow or decline just based on how the people we hired were interacting. And of course, as we changed out people for the right people, the practices would grow. So this is the very beginning of the very first good neighbor practice that I bought. It was the entire lab and sterilization was in here. Of course, there was nothing actually sterile in there anymore by that point. Um, we, had, we found a lot of fun things. Ended up just totally gutting the place, which is what we did for a few of them, so we could build up a much nicer office. Oh, we came across fun stuff. So this was, I couldn't tell you who that is, you know, what man brand is. Breath deodorant. 
I think this traces back to the 50s or 60s, I don't know. And for any of you who have done amalgam, even in 30 years ago for me, amalgam came in the triturated capsules. I've never seen a mercury spiller. But you know, we still talk about where you're doing a one spill, two spill, or three spill amalgam capsule. Well, it comes from this. You'd push the lever and tipped it over and it gave you one spill or two or three. I didn't know that. I had to ask the guy about the practice from what the heck that was. So fun. We didn't play with the mercury. We disposed of it properly. This is that same office today. Slides are a little bit dark on there. Sorry, but you can see we've just built it into the really nice, clean, modern facility. Uh, this, on the other hand, is Norge Dental Center, today's Norge Dental Center, where everything has a purpose. And that's the whole idea is that every single component, every item we put in there, everything we put, purchased and put money towards had to have a specific purpose towards customer service. We wanted to make sure that everything we were doing was customer service oriented. So we have great big windows. I actually, when they put the very first wall up in that operatory, very first up off the floor, I went over there with a, with a uh, beach chair and laid it out because it's about the same height as a, as a dental operatory chair. I sat there with my beach chair and I tilted it back and I realized the windows were up about a foot too tall. I couldn't see outside other than just the sky basically. And I wanted my patients to be able to just enjoy the view. We, we planted crazy gardens and trees and flowers out there so you could see it. I worked in a dental office when I was still in school that had that little tiny six inch wide window that went about three feet down on the side of the room. That was a dungeon, I, I couldn't stand it. So when I started designing my own practice after being in the first facility, which was just, you know, you, you get it how it comes. When I started designing my own, I decided we're gonna fill this thing with light, natural daylight. Number one, it's great for matching shades for cosmetic dentistry, but it really makes people feel better. So the window was too high. I called the contractor and I said, hold the phones, stop the presses. We're gonna reconstruct these walls a foot lower and change the height of our windows. So we did. Very, very purposeful. Every single operatory is the same, whether it's dental hygiene or dental operatories for, for actual work. Um, Everything put together well, the sconces to light the way down the hall, everybody's got a TV in the room where they can watch a little uh, HGTV or something like that. So it's just purposeful driven. Our reception room, please don't call it a waiting room, nobody's supposed to wait. Our reception room, and my staff knows that, if anybody says the word waiting room, you can hear a collective gasp. <gasps> from the rest of my staff in any kind of a team meeting. Don't say waiting room. So the reception room, all the magazines on that magazine rack, are there are two issues, this issue and the last issue, either two months worth or two weeks worth, whatever it is. You can't find a magazine in there older than two issues. There is a person in my office named Robin whose specific job, one of many, is to make sure the magazine stays current right there. I can't tell you how many people how many patients have commented over the years about number one, our collection of magazines, but also about how they're still current. People have be just become ingrained to know that doctor's offices have magazines that are three years old. It's ridiculous. Maintain your magazines. Everything very purposeful. The TV that is right there is always showing some kind of a dental mm, propaganda channel, if you will, just to let people know. It's quiet, there's no, there's no volume on it. Just letting people know, hey, we're a dentist. Big smiles throughout the room, why would you put up pictures of a sailboat? You're not selling sailboats, you're selling smiles. Put up big pictures of smiles throughout there. Everything in this room, very purposeful. Any kind of accolades that we've received recently, awards are gonna be on this little table so people see it. It's just a wonderful setup. On the other side of that wall is my reception desk. Well, let me back up. The reception desk is here with coffee and tea and juice and all that. Once you walk inside, it's our check-in and check-out desk. Those desks, all four of them, are built for privacy. Again, very purposeful. We've decided to go ahead and give people a little privacy while they're writing their checks so someone's not hovering over them for the next. One of those is a sit-down station. We have plenty of elder patients who would prefer to sit down while they're checking out or handicapped in wheelchairs, whatever. So four people at a time could be helped because it's a large building. In the back, we've got a waterfall. This waterfall is bigger than it looks, even though it may look big. I put them in the picture for perspective. Uh, it's the size, it's about one and a half dental operatories. So about 15 by 12 is the, is the overall size of this thing. It has a continuous stream of water running down it. It was actually patterned after a very specific waterfall. On a trip to Alaska, I took a picture of something called Horsetail Falls. I gave this to my contractor and said, build that inside my building. It's wonderful, it drowns out the noise of the drills, even just the noise of people talking. So even though we have open bays in all of our operatories, it's not like you're listening to the person right next door. So again, very purposefully built, everything about it. 
a pediatric reception room. Now this is wonderful because we don't have kids jumping around in our regular reception room. I'll call it our adult reception room. This is our family reception room, or pediatric so. The, there's little games for the kids to play. There's a Disney Channel always going. Nice little tent that I had my, my uh, fabric uh, lady make up. She makes curtains for us and stuff. A lot of romper room type stuff. They can get on, they can play. There's things on the wall. It's just a kid's paradise in there. And it's not bothering anybody because the moms are there. This is right outside the dental operatory. So here we are from another view. My two dental pediatric operatories, which by the way are set up exactly the same as all my others. However, they're decorated pediatric style. I've got animals hanging off the ceiling and kids pictures and all that sort of thing. Uh, all of that is the pediatric zone. 20% of our practice is kids. We thought why not cater to that market and again, people flock to us because of it. They tell their friends, everybody says. I just read a quote this week from a, a mom who wrote us back a review and said something to the effect of, her kids no longer think of it as going to the dentist, they think of it as like going to a playground. Oh, that's fantastic, we wanna have that effect on every kid. Lab and sterilization, what a far cry from that little tiny op uh, office I showed you with lab and sterile all kind of jumbled up in one spot. Laboratory separate from sterilization so that sterile things stay clean. And of course the lab is where we get all the, the meat of the work done. Lots of accolades put up on the wall. I refer to that as the wall of shame. <laughs> of course it's not. It's a whole lot of diplomas and course certificates from a variety of things we've done. And it's not even all that we have. It's just the ones we're kind of really proud of. If anybody actually stops to read them, they're impressive. And that wall becomes impressive too. It's right outside the bathrooms. Whenever somebody uses the bathroom in our facility, they walk out and they see that amazing wall of diplomas. Um, just down the hallways, so yeah, we're showing teeth everywhere else, but there's one fun hallway in the building. There's always pictures on both sides of a trip that I've recently taken. My patients know I travel, that's no secret. They know I'm spending my money to go fun places. So this is from a trip to Italy, that particular one, that's already been replaced. About every two years, I take some of the, my best pictures and I blow them up from places I've been and put them on the wall. We even have a label on them that shows you know, where it is and what date I took it on and all that. A number of my patients have gone on trips to the same places because of the pictures. They said, I saw your pictures of Florence. I told my husband, we've got to go to Florence. Fun stuff like that. It's a way to interact and, and mingle with patients. I hesitated to put that up because maybe it's bragging, but in reality, people know I'm a dentist. They know I'm gonna spend some money and travel. This is just a fun way to connect with other people, patients who love to travel also. It creates a good conversation piece. Here's our reception room. Hard to see inside this too much because it's a little darkened, but here's what the inside of, the, of that room looks like. Three very comfortable lounge chairs, not straight up back you know, folding chairs or the kind you get from, from a dental catalog. These came from a commercial furniture uh, supplier. Very comfortable, three lounge chairs. I've got all my little knickknack stuff here that I want to show patients, models of implants and things like that. Uh, one computer screen in case there's something we need to go over on the computer, but basically we go in there to talk. So I refer to that as my living room. I don't call it a consult room. I say, let's go to my living room and have a chat. Please get a cup of coffee if you like and come on in. We'll, we'll talk about your treatment. We use that as an introduction to every single new patient. The doctor, the hygienist, and the patient will sit right there for five minutes. And my question is basically, what can I do for you? And then I shut up and listen because that's the best thing you can do in that situation. Um, again, very casual, nice soft lighting. And I can't tell you how many people have commented on Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. Most other dentists just put you in the chair and lean you back, you're staring at the bright lights on the ceiling. Patients really want to be heard and this is a great way to start listening to your patients. Here's two operatories. Does that look familiar to you? It should, they look just like yours. I mean, the color of the chair might be different. There might be a few varieties of tools on there, but let's face it, a dental chair is a dental chair. And certainly to your patients, they all look the same. What's different here? Absolutely nothing, in other words, you and I, we're all in the same boat. Your practice, my practice, my neighbor's practice, my best friend's practice, we're all in the same, we're dentists, working out of those chairs every day of the week. We're all in the same boat. It's how we steer that boat, or how we steer our group, that makes a difference. That's the customer service component. That's a wagon train. Man, that's a wagon train. That's not functional, and that is. They both have wagons and horses and people but this one's chaos, and this one's nice straight linear line, they're going someplace. That's your practice, this has to be your practice. If that's your practice now, you're in trouble. You can't have a big cluster of just whatever happens today happens. You need a plan, you need a customer service plan, just like you need a treatment plan for dentistry. 
What makes a great dental office work? I worked at McDonald's the first four years of my working career, two years in high school and two years part-time in college. How is it that I was able to go in and half an hour after my starting moment, I was on the French fry maker making French fries? It's the same way every new startup happens. It's systems, there's leadership and systems. McDonald's runs its organization on the backs of a bunch of 16 year olds, a multi-billion dollar organization on the backs of 16 to 18 year olds. How? There's some leadership, it starts at the top, there's a committed team, and maybe not every 16 year old, but the ones that have been there a while, especially the management, and then it's systems. Systemize everything. McDonald's makes it work because I went in the back where the staff lounge is, they plugged in a video, this was VHS at the time, I watched a 30 minute video on how to make french fries. When I came out, I knew how to make french fries. They put me in front of the fryer and they said, do what you saw in the video. And I did it. I did that for a week. The next week, I watched the hamburger video, not to be confused with the quarter pounder or the Big Mac videos. So it, there was, I don't know, 40 or 50 tapes, each about a half an hour, of how to do everything in that, in that building. They only needed me to watch about half of them to do my job. I ended up watching all the others because I was curious as to how the building worked. Well, it wasn't too long before I was being a shift manager at the age of 17, closing the store, making the bank deposit and all that. Why? I took ownership. I became one of the leaders in this leadership thing and I was committed as a team member. I just was curious how the place worked. But what I really discovered was systems make or break a business. What are our most valuable assets? Is it the drill? Is it the team? I know everybody's thinking that already. It's ourselves. Yes, it's our team. Include the doctor in the team. It's ourselves. The most valuable asset you have going for you, the way to get to customer service A plus level is ourselves. With each other, interacting, and understanding ourselves and each other. So a big part of this video, the series of videos, is not just here's what we do, it's here's how you can do it. I don't wanna give you a bunch of platitudes. We're not gonna just say, hey, let's dig in and, and, and roll up our sleeves and we're gonna get busy, we're gonna take no prisoners, yay, let's go. What are you gonna do? There, there's no focus there, there's absolutely no go-to moment. It doesn't tell you what key to press on the keyboard next. It's like when my, uh, my video or my computer tech on the phone will say something like, uh, all right, I want you to go in and change the, the cache. Like, like, slow down, what's the first button I hit? Do I grab the mouse or the keyboard? You know, I need steps along the way because I don't understand your terminology. Well, same thing here. Your team may not understand your customer service terminology or mine. I'm gonna give you very specific examples of how we improve, how you can improve customer service all along the way through your practice. And it begins with understanding ourselves and each other. What's at the core of our business? I would say the core is not fillings, it's, provide, it's a series, it's a statement. It's providing excellent dentistry in a friendly, comfortable environment. The excellent dentistry is expected, by the way. Patients don't come in because they think you're the best dentist. Maybe a few. Maybe they've heard, oh, this guy's really great but they don't know that a crown margin with a 20 micron gap is better than a crown margin with a 75 micron gap. I don't even know that those numbers are accurate. I don't know that I know the difference between microns anymore. I know that my work is exceptional, and it has to be to support a 30 year practice, otherwise it will fail, but what really makes this is the last half of that statement, a friendly, comfortable environment. If you're not delivering that every day, patients assume the rest of your operation is just falling apart or also average, so you've got to get above average on this. I'm going to tell you about two restaurants to exemplify what I'm talking about. In this location, which now says Oceans and Ale, used to be a restaurant called Giuseppe's. Giuseppe's was formed from a husband and wife team who had another restaurant, very successful, very high-end, five-star dining, maybe the only five-star restaurant we had in Williamsburg. It's kind of a small town. They had an amazing chef. The guy's name was uh, Dan, Dan the chef. That's important to the story. And they were doing great. It was actually a little art museum as well. You could go in and buy paintings off the wall for thousands of dollars and stuff. So really fine institution. Well, they got divorced. She ended up with the restaurant. He ended up with Dan the chef. People knew Dan's cooking. Dan was nothing short of amazing. So Joe, as in Giuseppe, opened up Giuseppe's here. And every day on the sidewalk was a little, little marker, you know, those little uh, sidewalk lean-to things. And it was a chalkboard and it would say, tonight, Dan's meatballs. Tonight, Dan's lasagna. It was always about Dan. Dan's cooking. Everybody knows Dan. He got the chef, which means he did very well. She did fine. The restaurant thrived for a lot longer. But he did so well, he ended up moving around the corner and building his own building. I'll show you that in a minute. 
But Dan and Joe were a team. They had an amazing product. They had amazing service. Joe was there every single day and night. The poor man takes off two weeks in January. That's it. Otherwise, he's closed Sunday, Monday. But he is always there, knows you by name if you're a regular, knows the kind of wine you might like, brings over a bottle of wine, something new that he got in. Listen, I got three cases of this. I know you guys like the Pinots. This is a really good one. Just got it from Germany, you know, whatever. Really connected with his, with his clientele. And he had a lot of repeat customers, so he was able to. That's the kind of customer service I'm talking about. A guy who knows you, for someone who knows your interests and is willing to cater to that when you come to see their place of business. This, on the other hand, has been four different restaurants. It's a very pleasant building. It's a little bit more out in the country, not too far for people to go to, but the customer service there was abysmal. The first, maybe only, time we ever went there was we went in and the young lady sat us at the table and kind of threw two menus at us and didn't say a word. Okay. Look through the menu, wait, you go where this is going. It was just not a fun customer service restaurant experience. Well, six months later, they were closed. It's been four more restaurants, two of them under the same ownership, failed both times, tried to change the menu, nothing worked for this guy. So it is currently a restaurant again, still there's no cars in the parking lot. I go by it every night on the way home, there's never cars in the parking lot, I'm not sure how long he's gonna last. There's no customer service there. The food was fine, there was nothing wrong with it, but the customer service just isn't there. He doesn't know how to run a restaurant. Plain and simple. Here's Giuseppe's now. He built this entire building, took over most of the ground floor, rents the upper, rents some space to the side. He's doing quite well. He's become a little real estate magnet because of his efforts. His sign up on the top, phenomenal business. Why? Customer service. They're both serving food. They're both serving good food. Joe's might be a little better, but it's the customer service that makes or breaks you. So what is at our core? What did I say? Provide excellent dentistry in a friendly, comfortable environment. What happens over time if we ignore our core, we'll be that second restaurant. If you don't know your core business, which is the friendly, comfortable environment part, things are gonna falter. Yeah, if you mess up the dentistry, that'll eventually bite you in the butt too. But honestly, that takes years to unfold. People just don't know that their work is bad until it finally goes bad. It's that friendly, comfortable environment. It's your customer service. Make it, and you'll be Giuseppe's. Don't, and you'll be that little building that keeps falling away to other hands. How do we maintain those core values? Simple enough. Continuing education, stuff like this right here that you're doing. If you're watching this, this is a CE course in customer service. Maintain that, go to things. I have historically split my CE about half clinical and half non-clinical. Practice management, leadership, customer service, and I know friends that spend 90-10. 90% of their time is really spent on dental, you know, improving their dental skills, and maybe 10% or even less on the soft issues, that is the customer service. You've gotta make a more conscientious effort at, at believing that you need more and more customer service education. Teamwork is number two of how we maintain our core values. We are acting as a team at all times. I am one of the team members. You know, when I meet one of my staff members or team members out in the community and I'm with friends, I may say something like, oh, this is Robin, we work together. I never say, she works for me, or this is my employee Robin. I've, I've just never said that, it didn't come to me naturally. I just started saying right from the get-go, oh, this is so-and-so, we work together at my office. It's that working together attitude that really maintains your core values. Because I believe that in my heart. I don't think, oh, I'm the boss, I sign the checks, they have to do what I say. Because they could go somewhere else. If I'm a bit of a jerk, they could go work for somebody else tomorrow. I believe that we are a team, and you have to have that in your head at all times. Lastly, it's communication. I've been talking about this a whole bunch already. If you are communicating with each other and with your patients, then everything will fall into place. If you are a quiet, silent type, get over it and start talking. You've gotta have conversations, both with your teammates and with your patients as they come in. That's the end of part one. I hope you've enjoyed it. There's a bunch more. I look forward to talking to you.